Good evening, everyone. I'm Avisa, and I am happy to welcome you to a fantastic Uncle Bobby's virtual author event. We are here tonight to celebrate Marlon Peterson's amazing piece of literature that he just put into the world this year. It's called Bird Uncaged, an Abolitionist's Freedom Song. And tonight, special for you audience, we have not one author, not two, and not three, but four of the most brilliant writer minds to be in, open, in an open and engaging conversation tonight about this book. So get comfortable and strap in. If you haven't already gotten your copy of Bird Uncaged, do yourself a favor and click the button below at the bottom of the screen to purchase it from Uncle Bobby's online bookshop. And if you're in Philly, just stop on over to Germantown and pick up your copy in the store. After the panel lays it all out for us, there's gonna be time for uh, a few audience questions. So please submit them over the course of the conversation using the ask a question module at the bottom of your screen. And I would not like to waste any more time. So please allow me to introduce our guest for tonight. We have Dr. Regina N. Bradley. She's the Associate Professor of English and African Di Diaspora Studies at Kennesaw State University and the author of Chronicling Stankonia, The Rise of the Hip Hop South. We have Kiese Lehman. He's a writer, editor, and professor of English and creative writing at the University of Mississippi. He's the author of Long Division, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, and Heavy. We have Akiba Solomon. She's an award-winning journalist and editor with renowned writings on culture, race, gender, and re reproductive health. She's the co-author of How We Fight White Supremacy, A Field Guide to Black Resistance, co-authored with uh, Kenya Rankin. And our featured author, Marlon Peterson, he's the principal of the social justice consulting firm, The Presidential Group. He's the host of the Decarcerated Podcast, a senior Atlantic fellow for racial equity. He's a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network and 2015 recipient of the Soros Justice Fellowship. Ebony Magazine named him one of America's 100 most influence, influential and inspiring leaders in the black community. I could say more, but I'm gonna let, let him speak for himself. Everyone, let's do this. Two, hello. Hey, what's up? Hi. Hey. Hi, everybody. Here we go, and I'll see y'all later. <laughs> All right, thank you, Lisa. Hey, good people. What's going on? I'm here. I'm Marlon, show everybody your, the feathers on your head. Yeah, you got to show the feather hat. In fact, literally, the feather in your cap. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, the that's, that's for Georgia. See, Georgia, I know how I do the feathers and the hats. See, see? Oh, <laughs> excuse me. I didn't know you still, you know, the playlist, because at one point, we had some issues. <laughs> um, are we talking about the issues or, or, or no? We ain't talking about the <laughs> I don't know. Let's not do it. Let's not do it. Oh, okay. All right. You know what the issues is. I was like, young man, young man. Uh, I got a question. Yes, hey, I got a question, Akiba. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know you probably yeah. think about asking about your arm, but yes. you know, how your house is that your house? Why is so how your house so clean? Right. I just, <laughs> okay, I just moved here last Tuesday. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 I just box. moved. Where the box I haven't is. had time to the boxes are hidden away because I was trying to, you know, look fresh for okay. this event. But I see here that, you know. See, mm -hmm. I see how people are. So, anyway, y'all gonna get yes. this red background, and y'all gonna love this red background, and and we gonna keep moving. That this is that's what's up. up. <laughs> that's what's up. Yo, can I can I um uh, can I can I kick it off with a question? I miss I mixed the pregame. I don't know if y'all got it set up for something else. No. No. Nope. Nope. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 um, Marlon and I talked uh, a few days ago. We we were in a conversation with the brilliant Tongo, um, Ethan Martin. And one of the things that we brought up, I asked Marlon about was guns. And one of the things you said to me, Marlon, was, you know, when you're talking to people about guns, you try to talk about how important it is to divest from all diff all all Americanisms if we can. And I think all of our work in some way is about, yes, the divestment from Americanisms, but also the way we as black folks have remixed that investment in Americanism. So I want to talk, I want to ask you again, Marlon, 
about if you can say what you said to me about guns to the rest of the people but i'm also interested in in like hip hop as a kind of remixed investment in americanism and or a divestment of americanism and marlon can you just before before we go into that cuz i just think i really want to hear everybody's like thoughts about not just the gun because like while while so many of us like are baptized in hip hop, are talking and walking the way we do because of hip hop, the gun is so prevalent in that music that we love. So I'm interested in like how we deal with like divestments of Americanisms when those remixed Americanisms are as much a part of us as the Americanism. That's the first I question. Start us off with this though. No, I know, no, no. I'm like, okay. okay. You know, okay. I to, no, I'm just free game. I'm just game. I ain't know. I ain't know I what. I'm not one love or anything. <laughs> that's a warm love. Yeah. That's, that's a soft bomb for y'all. Shit. Ooh. Um. God damn. Well, here's the thing, right? Um. <laughs> uh, what I, I mean, like I think, but like what I was speaking about the other day when we spoke was, um. When I said device divestment or the way you use the divestment from Americanisms, I think about guns in a larger context than in that like guns, the way we are conditioned to believe in guns as a nation is the Americanism. Like we're conditioned oh. to believe in it yeah. as like, you know, that's why it's the Second Amendment, right? right? <laughs> you know what I mean? In the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. right? It's, you know what I mean? Like we believe it's it's part of the ethos of the nation, right? So of course, as people who were brought here, there's an ethos that we were sort of like, we were conditioned to be a part of. The part of what we've also been able to do, we've been able to remix everything, right? Mm. Right, everything, like look at how we make chicken, right? I'm just saying like we mm. remix everything. That's part of our brilliance and resilience and all the good things and creativity and all the shit that we are, are you know, great about us, right? But I'm also saying that like, and the reason why I'm, I can say what I said about guns is that, like, I also see that overwhelmingly guns harm us. Yes. This, I mean, like, this overwhelming. There's no question they can't protect us. They can be strategically used for liberation and liberatory causes. Of course, no one is denying that. But overwhelmingly so, they have harm us either by by white folks, by police, and definitely by each other. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so. When I say the investment, like or the divestment from guns, even um, I, I, I just I just look at what's happening on the daily, what I've seen, what I've grown up seeing, what we hear about now, and that also that like guns are used. We can use it for protection, all those things, but also guns are used because they because we use them to harm ourselves at times. Oftentimes, they're also used to create policy that harm mm -hmm. us more. Ooh. Right, like, oh yeah, using all these guns. So now we gotta put more police in your neighbor, and then we gotta do this. Ooh, shit. Ooh. I'm just saying, that, like, and it's complicated, it's complex, but that's you know that's how I see. It. I feel like you know, let's see what Akiba and Regina want to chime in on, and also hip hop. I ain't chime on the hip hop joint, but I ain't gonna take all the time. I mean, this show event. What do you mean you don't take up all the time? Oh, <laughs> right? that's why. I am. But I mean, so, um, so <laughs> what, what I can say about the 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 culture part of it is that unfortunately after you know 30 some years of listening to this music i'm desensitized to it mm. i'm at the point now where it almost feels figurative yeah um i'm i'm i'm, it, I'm not I, I wouldn't call myself half asleep like i pay attention to lyrics i pay attention to metaphor i pay attention to all of it but i just have this almost self-created blind spot because it's so common it's like ambient noise wow um and then What's crazy about that is then also what is so absolutely dramatic and indelible about getting people shooting each other in real life, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this fantasy life where, or I have this sort of weird fantasy life where, I, of course, I don't agree with this stuff at all. Right. But it's almost like if I'm going to function in any kind of cultural world, um, anything past, I would say, 1988, then I'm going to have to desensitize myself to it. But then obviously you see and you hear all of these really horrible self-inflicted a lot of times as Marlon said, but also just in general inflicted violence and that disconnect is so large, but it doesn't feel large until it actually happens. Right. Okay. So it's easy to be like, you know, oh, I see guns all the time. I hear guns, I hear gunshots. You know, we were talking before we came on about uh, fireworks um all you know half the time i'm like is that fireworks or gunshots like, which one is it seriously and you're like oh, okay well you know from my new place i could see fireworks so i'm like oh okay good fireworks 
but it's something that you both become um, desensitized to. But then also, it, it again, it's indelible. Like it, it is still such a deeply violent and horrific act that, that disconnect. I think is also dangerous in a way. Mm -hmm. I feel that, Miss Gina May. Look, now I'm thinking. I'm thinking. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, the question makes me think about when we did the gun hall, the the town hall about guns and southern black folks. And one of the things that I remember saying um, when I was moderating is that as as a black southerner, I don't necessarily think about guns in the same way as the rest of the world does mm -hmm. because I feel like they were just a regular part of my everyday experience. They weren't anything to be scared of per se but i mean like you know my grandfather was like you know this isn't a toy right but i mean like it wasn't like i had never seen rifles and handguns you know what i'm saying so it was like i didn't i didn't think about that but when the was talking about desensitization i'm like oh, okay so i'm wondering if that normalcy of of engaging a particular type of gun culture on a daily basis um has desensitized me to like what the impact is is in hip-hop and then you know put that in conversation especially being in atlanta right now um, the the increase in gun violence has been terrifying, right? Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is like, what part of this is media sensational, you know, you know, sensationalizing stats. Um, the other part of it is, you know, what's what's that type of, of reality? So I think that, you know, when we think about this idea of Americanization, I think that that violence, particularly against black folks, is also a part of that normalized understanding of violence in the United States. You know what I'm saying? And then of course you have some artists who who utilize that to to build their brand, to build a particular type of dynamic within hip hop culture. You have other folks who it's in the background. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, yeah, guns are here, but that's not that's not what I'm about. Like it's just part right. of my, you know, so I think what's what's important to kind of think about too is this idea of gun utilization as an aesthetic, particularly yeah. as a black aesthetic. Because folks automatically mm -hmm. kind of associate the two, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then the flip side of that is, how do we deconstruct kind of like these very um, generalized understandings about what this type of violence is doing, not only to to, to the American community, but also how the folks see us. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like America is the who all over there. Like when people be like, who all over there? They'll be like, oh, America over there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because of we're continuously in the spotlight you know what i mean and part of that being in the spotlight is to you know highlight all of our warts and all and unfortunately gun violence is one of those things because what's what's fascinating is when we were in the pangea we didn't hear as much about mass mm. shootings but as soon as things started to open there's been a mass shooting on my news every day every mm. day for like the last three months you know what I'm saying? So I think it's important to put those things in conversation, especially to confront those things, because whether we like it or not, that's definitely a part of an American performance aesthetic, uh, both mm -hmm. within the country and how the, how international folks think about this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you know, one of the things I really love about all y'all's work, um, and so we focus in on Marlon, on Bird and Cage today, I want to locate this question in Bird and Cage. You know, one thing I, I love that you do, Marlon, is you, you, you use yourself as an example to to illustrate like slippages, right? Like, or contradictions or paradoxes. And even this conversation around guns is interesting, right? So we talked about popular culture, we talked about region, and we did this the other night. But my slippage comes in when I start thinking about gender, region, and guns. Because First of all, it doesn't matter what I say, write, do. My mama, my grandma, my aunties ain't never, ever, ever giving up their guns, ever. And unlike us, there's not as much history of those people using those guns to harm themselves. I have history in my family of black women use well, one black woman using guns to shoot cops and shoot niggas who was cheating, right? Um, but I wonder if we can even complicated a bit more. And I think you start to do this a lot in Bird and Cage if we bring gender and black women's experiences with guns and actually make that central to the conversation. Mm. What, yeah. ha what happens if we do that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, no question. Uh, I think that like, like, here's the thing, here's the thing regarding that, like, uh, we, we tend to only see it from like, a, a, you know, in gender, from a gender male perspective, right? That like, it's us, we doing it, we getting harmed by it, da 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 right? And you see on the news, all the things, right? Um, but I think like, when we, when we do that, one, 
we've done this before, we spoke about this before. One of the things we do is we erase the impact that that same, that, these, that other folks within are having the same experience mm. on, on the genetic spe spectrum. And particularly, they may be experiencing in nuanced, extreme ways that we don't realize. I kind of just sort of, you know, as, as, a, as, you know, as a man, like we, we assume that people experience everything the way we do, mm. right? But we, we so that's one thing we're sort of erasing the experience of people who have those sort of things. As you speak about, you know, your moms, your aunties, and all those uh, different people. Even the way you sort of said it in a almost in a jokingly way, in a joking way. Because I know you write about it, but like to shoot on niggas that's cheating, right? There's something about that, right? Because, um, and I don't, I don't, I can't purport to, to say it all, but there's something about that experience that like that is how people want to ex experience that type of trauma. And right. how do they react to it in that sense, right. right? There's something about that, right? I think that it, that we won't understand because we won't do that. We shouldn't, and I don't think that's definitely not the reason why we would use weapons, right? We use it right. against men oftentimes. Although I want to just even in this moment, the contradiction, contradiction, guns are what are used are used the most in case of domestic violence, men right. to women. That's that's the tool yeah. of choice, right? Yeah. So you know, even in that moment, I'm just sort of catching myself. But here's like I'm saying that like. There's something about that object, right? And uh, um, you know, I think about Nas. I'm like talking about hip hop, and you know, I gave you power, right? Like you're going mm -hmm. back to Nas old joints, right? And like you know, even that, what type of power are we giving it, right? So particularly as you know, as a cisgender man, like what type of power are we giving to that weapon? Yeah, that might be different from way that other people may be given to that weapon, right? We're given obviously the weapon don't shoot itself. We're shooting it. I, I get that, right? But you know, I, I think there's something to be said, particularly now. Um, I'll, and I'll, I'm gonna just say this thing. I'll end up with this. I remember writing a while ago a long ass piece uh, as highlighting how gun violence impacted a particular woman, a young girl in Chicago, right? Who was like a shooter. Like she was a teenager. She got killed at 17 years old, but she was known as a shooter in the neighborhood, yeah. but also she had a bunch of traumatic things that happened to her that, you know, you know, led her into a certain place. And for me, and I think that was like 2013, I did that. And for me, like looking into that story or that, that experience of that person in Chicago, um, it kind of like flipped the switch for me in so many ways, right? Uh, you know, I talk about it in this book where there's a point in time, I thought it was just all about us, like men doing it, we suffering, we in jail, we da 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 And there's a point I had to say, oh shit, nah, bro, like you missing the whole point and you can't do this work effectively if you're thinking like that. Right. There's this, um, there's this famous picture by Emery Douglas of, you know, the black woman with a rifle while she's holding the baby in the sling. And that image and that idea is so potent among a group of folks who I would consider nationalists or revolutionary nationalists. And so in that way, like the way that women engage with guns or, or the, the fantasy of how black women engage with yeah. guns can be lionized in a way where it's seen as protective. Yeah. Um, there was once I, I went to I went to Tallahassee for a year when I first graduated. And uh, it was during, it was 92, and there was a lot of gun, there was gangsta bitch, there were this idea of, you know, like the, the woman who knew how to handle herself. And I remember um, someone who I briefly dated or whatever, he had guns. And one of our bonding things was like, oh, let's see how you look with that. Wow. And so in that way, and I mean, I, I think you can see, like, I'm not gangster. Like, there's, I'm, <laughs> I'm not that. Okay. Like, I, I hope it's clear. Okay, shut up, Marlon. But the point <laughs> is, no, but the point is, you know, for me to, like, like, I went to a magnet school. You know what I mean? Like, go to magnet school, go to Tallahassee, end up in or whatever with somebody holding a gun and somehow feeling like that was um, political or revolutionary mm -hmm. or something like that. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to trivialize women's use of guns at all, particularly in revolutionary settings. Like I don't, I don't in any way minimize that, but I do think there's also this idea of a woman protecting herself and protecting the community that needs to be added to this conversation and why mm -hmm. guns would be normalized even if they're not normalized in in sort of your everyday life and i and regina too you know the disconnect i think between the north and the south i do think is is real too 
Um, you know, guns are a lot more normalized in the South. Obviously, you know, in Philly, where I'm from up here, you know, to pick up a gun as a woman or to pick up a gun in general is generally not associated with any kind of um, uh, hunting or any sort of, mm-hmm. you know, like protection of the house. It's mm-hmm. normally because you are about to go shoot somebody for some reason. Wow. So there is that disconnect. But it was just interesting for me from Philly to go to the South and have that experience and feel like, oh, OK, this is part of a culture. And to a certain extent, it's a, it's a bonding. It's a very twisted bonding, but it was still a bonding. I feel that deeply, Akiva. Thank you for that. Gina May? What? <laughs> no. I don't know, I, I, All right, tell I, your story now. Tell your business. I mean, I. I'm, 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 you probably got a gun on the table right now. You know, you're like, like, hold on, let me put this down. Hey, you know my life. You know my life. Lucille is put up upstairs. Okay? <laughs> I just want to make sure that you know don't be having me out here. <laughs> So I'm gonna call my job and shit. Uh, <laughs> and <the people> <laughs> yeah, I just you know, I'm still I'm I'm still like chewing on this a little bit, and this is something I actually wanted to ask Marlon if that's cool, Key. Yeah, because yeah, yes, indeed. I'm just so fascinated by how you discuss your mother, mm. and your mother is is about it. She about that life, you know what I mean? And you didn't say she was about that life, but just the way you described her, like your dad was trying to be saved and sanctified, and she was like, no, nah. <laughs> fuck all that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm wondering how the relationships with your mother and other women that you mentioned, you know what I'm saying, how that influences your continuously evolving idea about what violence is and how violence takes root or takes root um in these in these different crevices of your life because you you introduce so many different types of violence which honestly i put when i read this i immediately put you in conversation with somebody like a richard wright Mm. and the way that richard wright grappled with articulations of black masculinity performance Mm. of black masculinity um in particular in black boy when you know what i mean they were whooping his ass because he wanted to go to the library or they were like you know what i'm saying and then like you were like look all i was trying to do is be a good good you know jehovah witness and and (laughs) that's the word and you know what i'm saying and i'm like all of these things that black boys and black men aren't supposed to do we're not supposed to be dry we're not supposed to be um normal you know what i mean like there needs to be some type of violence in our experiences to validate a particular type of black masculine experience. So it's like when I was reading it, I thought about black boy, I also thought about George Jackson and Soledad brother, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it's like there's a you're 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 in conversation with this legacy. Kiese, he's definitely in conversation with you and how to slowly kill yourselves and others. I just feel like I need to know, Marla. I need I'm like I, I need to know like how do you see this evolution of black masculinity through this trauma lens that has not really changed since we've been here, but really hasn't, I mean, especially within the last 50 years, 100 years, we're still using these particular type of trauma of trauma as a particular type of dynamic to understand a black male experience. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of get your thoughts about how do you see yourself in conversation with these type of authors, especially the way that you're presenting your story and ultimately the story of so many other black men. Mm. Uh, thanks for that. Well, I want to start with my moms. I think you know the way I had a specific intention about writing my mother, writing about my mother in this book because I don't think like my mother don't, don't ain't read none of the shit we read. Just you know she ain't read none of the shit that we read. So all the books we read, all of them, she ain't read none of that shit, right? She a strong black woman who who did good for herself and her family, right? Um, but I wanted to just like I wanted to sort of give sort of like a full biology biography to like people who engage in all type of shit that's fucked up violence and all that i wanted to sort of engage i, I really wanted to, in so many ways lift up my mother for what my mother was doing mm-hmm. right in terms of her sort of saying no this is who i am and i'm married to you and i got kids by you and i love you but this is your choice in life it's not my choice in life mm-hmm. and it might be good for you i'm happy you're doing it. you needed this you needed god to help you because you was doing some stuff but i'm good and i'm gonna be like this right and i don't think as i, I don't know if she had that sort of political understand view of it, right? And I wanted to sort of just uplift that because I know there's a lot of my, my mothers, a lot of Elsas, right, who don't see it through that. Level. So that's one thing. 
So the other part of your, um, your question about black men and me in conversation and evolution and all those sort of things. Um, I felt like I needed to be able to make very clear in, in, in our time, in our moment in the 21st century right now, one, what we've experienced is like, is in a legacy of sad things that we've experienced. One, like there's nothing new, but that because of like the concentration of the different types of violences that are happening all the time, yeah. like it's mm -hmm. all the time. And that like, for one, I want to say for real, like some of us, you know, black, we need some grace because we like moving through all this shit. Right. First of all, we're moving through it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and two, I wanted to like, like slow it down. Right. So even like when I speak about the different things, I don't go into detail about every single thing I've seen. And sometimes I just say we just moved on. This happened. We moved on. And I wanted people to like really just sit back and say, oh, my God. And that was just one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was just one thing. And it, and it didn't even seem all that big. Right. But I wanted people that like and for some some of us, all these things that happen, the gunshots outside, seeing people shot, the crack vials, all those things, incarceration for some of us, the desensitization, desensit uh, desensitization has been so real that it might not be that big of a deal to right. some mm -hmm. point. I wanted to get to that it is a big deal to some of us. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I, wanted, I, I think as a, as a, you know, as an adult now, I wanted us to be okay that to say that this is a big deal, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. Oftentimes you don't say it's a big deal. Oh, so homeboy got shot down the block. You went to school with him, right? Were you all like third grade with each other? Like, think about that. Like he went to third, you was in third grade with him. And now like your homeboy shot him. And it's like, oh, we just smoke on a blunt over that and joking about that. It's like, no, there's something happening there. And that's not, it's not healthy that we just move and pass it because we don't know how that's how that's impacting our reactions, our reactions to everyday things, and definitely our interaction with the people who are closest to us, right? Mm -hmm. So we may not come home like back in the day when you hear how the men had a hard day of job when the white man came home, kick a dog, hit his wife, we make that as like a joke. But like that same experience is happening to 12 year olds, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Right. Right. or variations of that experience. And I just wanted to sort of like give them some sort of understand like what they're dealing with. I was dealing with some of this and I didn't have the worst experience as a kid living in, in Brooklyn. I didn't have the worst of experiences, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? I, had, I had a good household. I came home. I was fine. At least I could go home and be safe. Yeah. I just know a lot of our people can't go home and be safe too, right? And but, I just wanted to know that. Marlon, one thing I wanted to lift up, if it's okay with y'all too, is you, you talk about violence, but the particular violence you dealt with the most was robbery. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the the content, I mean, just the the regularity of the robberies, and how that made you feel it, it primed you to feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. And then there was the assault that you wrote about, but just this this constant specter of robbery. And the first one that happened when you were a child, how old you were? You were like in what fifth grade. I was in sixth grade, starting sixth grade. So in sixth oh, grade, was, you were only in sixth grade, but you knew enough about how sick this society was to feel ashamed, to feel like you know this was something that was on you. Right. And this, the what runs through your book. I mean, there's there's obviously trauma that runs through your book, but it just really made me sit down and think about what it is to be constantly robbed by people that look like you Ooh. and yeah. how you both internalize it. But then you have this piece where you, you name all of these things that are happening. You say, but then it was okay. But then it was okay. But then it was okay. Because you were showing that it was expected to be normalized, but that this stuff is cumulative. And so mm. I don't know if I have a question. I just wanted to bear witness to that because you know, I I know I know people who dealt with constant robberies, particularly during this period, and nobody there was never any real reckoning. There was never any real, you know, let's take a deep breath. There was never any big hug. It was just like, oh, I got robbed. Oh, I got jumped. Oh, I got yeah. robbed. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. I mean, I think the first time I started thinking about like the kind of the robberies like this um, was when. Um, I was running a youth program here in Brooklyn some years ago, 
And I remember having a kid, he was a young kid, he was a freshman in high school, and he came and he went, he came to the program, it was after school, and uh he didn't, he was like unique, uh, abnormally quiet that day. And then one of his, you know, classmates, you know, she came and told me, like, hey, this happened to him. And I mean, I, you know, we did what we could to support him and him and his school and all those sort of things. But I'm just saying that made me sort of it was the first time at 30, how old, 30 something years old, that I really sort of sat back and said and really thought about like what I felt like back then, or, or at least processing it. Mm. Um, and that like, cause he felt ashamed, right? He felt ashamed and he didn't want to say nothing, right? And I, and I kind of, I could, I could have obviously relate to that. I guess the, those experiences I think um, had built up a lot of issues with not trusting a lot of things and a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. even to, me, to this day, I think I even to the book, the book is somewhat incomplete in that, right? Like this is the issue with trusting things and people because I know, uh, I've had those experiences right. with people close to me, and uh, even with the other day, uh, Kessie, when we was on the on the on the other talk with uh, Tongo, and I I had noticed it that I kept saying the word safe. Yeah, right. In regards to like other things, writing made me safe. Right, right. I was, you know those sort of things. Right, and uh, you know, and. and I've been using that word safety in various ways or the work I've done is in safety in so many ways, even inside when I was still locked up, not notice, not realizing that I had an issue with feeling safe. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, had it, like I didn't know I, like I knew what it was happening, but I didn't know. Right. I didn't have no language and all that sort of stuff for it. I think Akiba, I think just in the larger context that um, those experiences of robbery take away from, uh, can take away from mine, but also can take away from people who've experienced that their feeling of wholeness, like your wholeness can always be taken away. Like you feel good today, you had a good day at school, you had to pass a test or whatever it was, like but something could be taken away, mm. right? And so even as you go further into the book, like I talk about happiness is the thing I struggle with, or the last, the last word in the book or the last sentence of the book is happiness is next. And I think that like, as a kid who did well in school, um, those experiences of like having them think like happiness taken away, like I did good in school, fuck that. Like, you know, and the person who robbed you don't know what the hell is going on, right? But like they taking something away, they taking something away. And it made me not want to sort of even appreciate good things that happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Like even this book came out, it, you know, Darnell, homeboy Darnell Moore, I was talking and he was like, yo, you should be happy about this. And I was like, I should, right? Ooh. And I was you know, like, I yeah, should. That's real though. Yeah, that, that, that deep. You get too deep, bro. You get too deep. You too deep. Well, yeah. because I don't know. I, that was that's what I was going to ask, and this and this is something that I I can hear from everybody on this is is as somebody who wrote who wrote a book this year too. You know what I'm saying? Like one of the things that folks have fussed at me about is, well, you're not really taking time to celebrate, and I'm like, it don't feel right. Like it don't feel right to, to celebrate. I don't. I don't, don't come for me. This ain't my session. But one of the things <laughs> I would. <laughs> One of the things that I was thinking about, because I know I'm, like, I know I'm going to get this offline, so y'all just okay. One of the things I was thinking about though is, you know, Marlon, I was first introduced to your writing through Key Essays chapter where y'all were writing epistolary form, right? So I'm wondering, you know, if you could talk a little bit. Of, and Key Essay, I want to hear this from you too. Is like when you first, when you did the first edition of How to Slowly Kill Yourselves and Others, you know what I'm saying? There was a, you said that there was a particular vision that the that both the you know the the publisher wanted you to put out there that that conflicted with your your innermost right. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean so I'm wondering like how did how do y'all use the writing to work through the shame work through the guilt what how does it because it does it's not static right like it's not just a solid mass massive thing that you know me talking about shame this way is going to stay the same way as I get from how to slowly cure right. yourself to heavy or from you know what I'm saying uncaged to you know what I mean so I'm just curious like how how do you work through that as like a live because with black folks you know what I'm saying shame and guilt are a living breathing thing whether we want to admit that or not so i'm just kind of curious to hear about how that manifests in the way that you present your story on the page i mean i'll, I'll say this about echo and i'm gonna be talking about um marlon's contribution to that collective essay and this is something you said in our conversation bro like i think sometimes people ask us all like what do you do with writing do you write through whatever 
I think sometimes we don't stop to think about like the shape of what we write when we're confronted by blank. And what mm -hmm. Marlon did in Echo, and hopefully Marlon, you can talk more about this. I mean, one of one of the wonders, just for me to say, y'all, like one of the wonders of reading Bird Uncaged is because I'm I know Marlon, I love Marlon, I know Marlon loves us as deeply as anybody I've ever met. But also when Marlon wrote that that the the last verse of Echo. He says it himself in the piece. He wasn't ready to write it, right? So, 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 so he pushes through it real fast, but he still gets the residue of stuff there, with, like which is what artists do. And 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 we knew he was gonna come back to that and do something. We didn't know it was gonna be a fucking ma as masterful as Bird Uncaged. But I just think it's really interesting that while while we and specifically Marlon was writing that section, and it's the last it's the last verse in that in that piece. But it's also the fastest moving. And I think it's mm. the fastest moving for lots and lots of reasons. But I wonder, Marlon, if you can talk about the pacing of that and why at that point you couldn't linger. You couldn't sit down in what you were saying, but you trusted us enough to get it out. I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I wasn't ready to deal with it. Yeah. Mm. I, I, that's, you know, when we, when you asked me to do that piece and then read in, you know how we did our, we read, we literally read what the other person wrote and just responded, right? It's really like a letter. That's how it went. And I, first of all, one, I appreciated it, but like, there's also like, damn, why y'all going here? Like, why y'all making me <laughs> here? Right? That's the other thing, right? And I, you know, when I figured I had to, and I remember as I was writing it, like, I'm you know, there's parts of it where I was, it was written fast and I was thinking fast and I didn't want to slow down to mm. think about it. Mm. I just knew that like one, you as a writer, as a creator, you know, you have something, you got to get it out. So you're going to figure out how to get it out. But like, I knew I wasn't ready to slow yeah. it down and give you detail and layers, but I just had to be like, well, for me, and even with this book too, like it was therapeutic in many ways to like put it on paper or on a screen. Like I needed to see it. Like mm -hmm. for the first time I was able to see it and in preparation for writing, you know, this book, you know, I would often go back to that echo verse, um, that, that piece and, you know, the part about, like I speak about incarceration, like, and I, I say uncle Gilmore's house. I think I call yeah, it this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uncle he's Gilmore, he's called, you know, Mr. Gilmore, he's a call that like, yeah. name for prison, right? Um, and I don't think that, I think that at that point in time, I thought that incarceration was the worst thing that happened to me. Yeah. Right? I think I thought that incarceration was the worst thing that happened or I experienced or I seen. And going through it past, you know, moving beyond that, it was like, no, it's these other things yeah. probably shaped that whole experience. And it was probably in so many ways much deeply impacted you more than that 10 years in, in, in prison. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I just think that like for that piece um, and then the expansion of it through Bird and Cage. For me, I needed to figure out how to test the limits of my vulnerability. And I think like uh, that was like a test. It's like a little, and I had never gotten. I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm on the lineup with you, Kai, uh, you, Darnell, and Mike. I'm like, oh shit, nobody know who the fuck I am. But like, <laughs> it's so crazy. You know, like, you know, so I had to also step my game up. But also, it was for me. That was a part of our own community, right? We yeah, had yeah, yeah. Like brothers, brothers, writing to live, right? And that was an organic thing that we just sort of created together, and that helped me get it out. Yeah, that, that was the, you all provided a space for me to test it. And then in the book, you 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 trusted yourself enough to expand that test. No, I don't think I trust him. I, I don't think I trusted myself to. Uh, I think that I needed to tell. I feel you. Happen. Mm -hmm. like I needed to share this, and also because so much of the work I've been a part of over the years was like me seeing iterations of me. Right. Right. And I, and it's like, I need, like, I need to go deeper into this. And because like as black men, black boys, we do a lot of harmful shit. Yeah. We do a lot of harmful shit. And I got to for me, it's like, why, the, why do we keep doing it? Right. Right. And then sometimes acknowledgement that like, we don't acknowledge 
that we have experienced harmful things. We yeah. think the worst thing I got, mm -hmm. that was the worst thing that happened to me, right? Like, and there might be in some like, it might've been the most dramatic thing that happened, the most, you know, illustrative thing that may have happened, most dramatic, but it's not the thing that might've harmed us the most. Mm. Subtleties that I wanted to sort of space to jump. So I didn't trust anything. I just knew that like, I needed to offer this out. Mm. I love that. I love that. Um, hey, can I ask y'all a question about <laughs> about young people? Like you and me? I want to ask everybody this because I'm a young because, people. I'm a young person. I know, but here, you see, okay, so you are You're a younger person. person. But there's a there's there's a legit young person on here, and that's and that's Gina May. Um, <laughs> compared, compared to I'm some of them. There she go. That's the younger one, Gina. No, no, no. It's the opposite, <laughs> it's the opposite of this, fam. You, you, you carry yourself in all ways, like, like a, like a, like a, like a wise ass, like you know, whatever. Um, but but for a second, let's act like you old like us, okay? <laughs> for a second, let's act like you old like us. This is. This, I was trying to think about y'all. Put on my Sarah Pearl. We put on my Sarah Pearl hat. All right, I'm ready. Whenever, whenever I'm talking to people uh, that I love, I, I I do like to do this work and think about like, damn, wait, why do I love this motherfucker? And what I what I what I've thought about with y'all in preparation for this is there's so many reasons I love you, and one of them is selfishly because you love us so deeply. But I also think y'all specifically love the young young people in us and young people. Akiba, fam, like when I was Gina May young and younger. Like you, you was the superhero to us. You know uh -huh. what I'm saying? Like, and and you still are. But at that point, you know, it was like I would. I felt like I would never meet Akiba Solomon. But but one thing I felt was that like you loved the 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 art and the culture and the people that made us move enough to actually use Marlon's word to sit and linger in that. Gina May. You put me to shame one day when I was talking about how, like, I think we were talking about the Migos. I was like, in Mississippi, I was like, yo, I can't fuck with that. We're in front of a group of people. And you were like, well, you can't love the kids if you don't try to love the music. You know, you can't love the kids unless you try to love the music. That's it. And Marlon, like, this book is 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 about you and the young person you were, but also I, I feel it's a it's a it's a it's a call to young people not to do better and all of that shit. But to but to but to tell their stories. That's what you said the other day. To, to, to tell your story, however possible, and then look at it. Where and why did y'all get that love of young people so intensely? And do you feel that from each other's work? Can we go there? I mean, yeah. I mean, I feel like for me, um, I'm constantly in conversation with my 13 year old self, who is mm. mercilessly bullied to the point of suicide like suicide ideation you know mm -hmm. what i mean um i just didn't want to do it no more you know what i mean so to go from such a violent toxic place is, is middle school and if everybody's like no seventh grade was great they had line and a half stop lying seventh grade suck <laughs> um, I, I continuously think about my my 13 year old self who was trying to figure it out you know what i mean um and the trauma of you know my folks getting divorced the trauma of going to a new place even though i had gone to albany my whole life every summer it's different when you know your black ass got to stay there first of all the heat with my true, ass true uh, <laughs> so but it was you know there was there was that um but i mean you know i just feel like especially for for black kids and black young folks the world's already so hard out here like i just want to make sure that i the work that I do, the the way that I engage as a professor, as an auntie, as a godmother, I want to be a soft place because mm -hmm. there's so few soft places for our kids, man. You know what I mean? Um, and as somebody who, you know, didn't really feel a soft place until I did permanently move in with my grandparents. Mm. You know, what I mean? my grandparents were my consistent soft place. Not saying it was easy, right. you know, because it was the strict Christian household. Uh, <laughs> so then, you know, Jesus over everything. Right. Uh, there, there was that, but I mean, like to be able to have a space that was considerate for you know to have a place that was was soft. Like I don't know how else to mm. to realize that, but to have a place that was soft 
especially mm-hmm. being in a, in a in a in a in a home where my grandparents did not come from soft places. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, what folks want to think like the Jim Crow South was such a long ass time ago. And I'm like, no, my grandparents right. were there. You know what I'm saying? Um, and the lessons that they learned, they instilled in me in such a soft paw way that I feel like it's my responsibility to handle youth in the same way. Mm. Because a lot of folks, they go get that. You know what I mean? So when I try to teach, when, you know what I'm saying? When I when I speak to folks, you know, and I listen to the music, and I'm like, for the record, I, I can't really rock with like that either. It ain't just you. But I'm not going to be like, that's bullshit just because right. it's not right. my era. My right. era. Right. <laughs> so I think that's I think one of the things to, to really kind of tackle is this idea of how do we create soft spaces for our youth where they feel like they can speak their truth unapologetically. And that's something that we continuously grapple with. Um, and you know, just being able to confront those mistakes, you know, to say that I didn't I didn't do that or I'm still consistently learning, yeah. continuously learning. I think is part of that process of making a soft place. And for me as a, as a writer and as a professor, that's, those are my tools to do that. Those are my tools to create these spaces. That's so good, man. That's so yeah, good. Yeah, so. What about y'all? I mean, I, I, it, my, my relationship to young people and youth culture, I think are two different things mm. in a way mm. because Right now, I mean, I hate to be this cliche, but I really don't like a lot of the youth culture that I'm exposed to. Mm. That's knowing that I don't know the crevices. I don't, you know, I don't know. Like, I like Gold Link, right? Like, Gold Mm. Link to me is nice. I like how, you know, he can sing, he can rhyme. He's a total package. Do I like what he says? No. Mm. Do I notice what he says at this point? Yes. So all the things that I used to say to myself, and so for folks who might not, I, I worked at The Source. This is what Cassie was talking about, The Source I magazine. I thought everybody knew, my fault. No, I mean, it, that, well, <laughs> this was pre, but this was pre-internet too. So it's like, right. it, I have a weird disconnect too because I had a whole career in music writing and culture writing. Mm-hmm. And then um, a lot of different things happened, including the collapse of the magazine industry. And I no longer do that. Now I work at the mm-hmm. Marshall Project which is a criminal justice news site. So it's in, in a lot of ways, it's very different from what I did before. But but my point is that um, I appreciate, I can appreciate some of the youth culture, but in a lot of ways, I feel old um, mm-hmm. when I approach it because it feels to me like there are people who are exceptional, who are moving the ball forward, who are artists and who are taking advantage of the freedom that they can find through online sales and their own promotions and that sort of thing. And then there's the thing that's packaged and sold to not just us, but generally in American culture that I think is really harmful. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not interested actually in grown ass men (laughs) to only talking about fucking doing Percocet doing all this shit, especially when I know for sure that their kids go to school in the suburbs. Ooh. I'm not interested in that. Ooh. I'm not interested in this idea of people who have hyper amounts of wealth who can actually really do some serious things in the community, but just continue to do the bullshit that they do because it's a more comfortable image. Mm. And I'm saying that particularly about men because I do feel like the men are the ones that are driving it. I think for the young women, I can appreciate, you know, this, again, it feels like a cliche to even like engage about Meg Thee Stallion, like, is it good, is it bad? Like, I think, whatever. I I, I, I appreciate Meg because I think Meg is talented. I think Meg is beautiful. I think that Meg has a really, actually an interesting and, and probably a growing sense of herself. You can see that. You can see that she's an artist who's coming into her own. But then there are all sorts of artists, young women artists out there that I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? (laughs) Like, what are you doing? They all, you all look the same to me. You all look the same. You sound the same. You talk about being a bad bitch. That's all you talk about. And in a way, as as, as an elder stateswoman who did all the different things in hip hop, 
I'm tired of hearing about it. I don't mm. want to hear about how good your pussy is anymore. Mm. You know oh. why in part? Because I don't care. I'm not interested <laughs> in that. That's, some, that's an aspect of everybody's life. Yay, pussy's great, wonderful. <laughs> but I don't, personally, I don't want to listen to that all the time. And I'm totally beyond the age where I feel like anybody's talking to me at all. Like nobody's mm. talking to 46 year old Akiba Solomon Nobody, when people talk about a bad bitch, they're not thinking of Akiva Solomon right now. So mm. I can't even like get into it and be like, oh, I'm about to go to the club. I feel, no, I'm, I'm like, the club like, no that's, that's yeah. not my life. And actually it's okay. Like, and right. that's the other thing, to know that it's okay. I'm a middle-aged woman, right? You, right. so you embrace being a middle-aged woman. All that said, and then I'm gonna get off this little soapbox is I feel such deep passion for in particular, young women that young woman who fucking took video of george floyd being murdered yeah shout out darnella frazier every time say her name every time yeah Danielle the the idea that, that 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 girl could have that amount of um trauma but have enough composure and have enough courage mm -hmm. to capture that Mm -hmm. You know, she changed. She changed the world. Yeah. And that, like that girl Daniela Frazier, to me, like that, that is a hero, and that is the heroism of a young person. Somebody mm -hmm. my age wouldn't have done that, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But she had mm -hmm. the courage. She had the fortitude of youth to go ahead and do that, and she was risking her own life doing that. Yeah. And I think that that's the sort of thing that we see all the time among our young people, and it needs to be uplifted. And I'm not just saying, oh, you have to, you know, videotape a, a fucking murder to be right. exalted. I'm saying that the amount of courage and spirit and connectedness that we see with these young people is so real right. that they deserve so much more. And I think that's part of what drives yeah. me to continue doing any kind of public work. That I see, I see these kids, I see what they go through. They have so much shit to deal with, and mm -hmm. yet they are still out there, still loving and still doing their thing. Thank you. And it might not be in the way, just real, it might not be in the way that we expect them to be courageous. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like I feel like yeah. one of the things that you know that Marlon's book reproved in my head to me is that the way that I think about what justice is at 16 and 17 is different than the way that I think about it at 27 is different than the way I think about it now at 37. I'm in a completely different tax bracket, education bracket. You know what I'm saying? And one of the things that I continuously have to remind myself about, especially when I have, you know, especially with my students and my daughter, she's 20, you know what I'm saying? Is like how they are experiencing this kind of, um, awakening, if you will, about what their truth is, you know what I'm saying? It's something that I feel like I can't just tune it out. So, I mean, thank you, Akiba, for that, because I was I couldn't have articulated like that, but I'm like, we can't use the language, the experiences, the cultural touchstones that we used in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s when we were the 20-somethings and the mm -hmm. teens. Because the world has changed, you know what I'm saying? And, and I think that's one of the things that we need to continuously grapple with in the culture also you know right. what i mean is like how do we make space for experimentation make space for these voices to resonate or echo in a particular way now that the walls have changed now that the 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 sounds have changed because of social media and all that so yes i'm with, i'm which i just wanted to make sure that I, I that was something i was thinking about as you were speaking is is you know, we can't use these outdated models of what this is what it means to be woke from 1992, yeah. 2002. You know what I'm saying? We need to make space for for them to articulate those things and continuously uplift them, even though we might not agree in the way that they're being presented. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't have much to add other than that. Like, um, I my my connect to young folks is because or young people, even youth culture is that I need to, for me, I want to hear what they, how they expressing themselves, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, you know, I ain't, you know, I may not be on all the new whoever's there, but like, because we always expressing ourselves, right? And you think about hip hop as 
great as it can be and as harmful it can be at times in terms of how sometimes they're always telling us something. You go back to 70, 80, 80 and you think about uh, what is it, the Furious Five, you know, like a jungle, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Like those are young dudes on a block saying about what was going on, like telling us something, right? And then we also could go forward, we got Akineli. And I, I think we gotta own that too. Like we had Akineli and if we put that on the right moment, we might put, we gonna sing it out, right? But, but the, <laughs> right, look at keep it smiling. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> All I'm saying is that the yeah, African name. <laughs> 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 I couldn't resist. Go ahead. Sorry. I have fall off with that one. Yeah, African. <laughs> All I know is that like they the thing about young people is that we they gonna they're gonna say and do things that as we get older we no longer agree with. That's just how it happens. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what growing up is. Um if we're in a position to, if we have the, the 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 wherewithal to, then I would advise us to try to listen to what they're saying in the ways that they say it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they, once again, just sort of like earlier about the gun thing, a lot of the bad policy that we have in our communities are created off of the things that our young people do or they or purportedly do. And I just want us, to, as we are growing and evolving as humans, to do a better job at not just thinking that we have to sort of contain young people, right? I, I don't know how, I'm not saying we figured it out, but I just right. know that it worked for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Let me just say something, y'all. Thank y'all for this. Please, we're not, it's not done, but please put your questions in the chat so these wonderful folks can respond to them. I have to dip right now, yeah. but uh, yo, thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all. Please put the questions in the chat. Please put the questions in the chat. All it's right. 11 jobs, man. I know, right? <laughs> Key on he all the ready, time. He getting ready for the game. He ain't fooling nobody. He getting ready for the game. <laughs> <laughs> he getting ready for the Hawks Bucks game. <laughs> he be right behind him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, questions, comments, and starting marks. You have a a question, uh, Marlon and, and and fellow panelists. Um, yeah. Can we talk about how we're going to move reparations forward quickly and abolish the police? This is from Melinda Gullick. I said your name wrong. I do apologize, but yeah, all, yeah. All this stuff we're talking about how. So we we gonna figure that out right now. How we gonna get the reparations and how well, we gonna? I mean, you know, what 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 does okay? So what what that look like for you? <laughs> what does that, that mean? What that, what that mean? I don't know. I don't know. But I listen. I, I, you know. <laughs> I know it's for reparations. But I know it's for reparations. So I'm gonna act like I'm an expert in reparations. Um, but I do think about the the, the police thing a little bit more because that's kind of like a little bit more up my alley. The only thing mm -hmm. I'll say, my, I just already got off another talk right before this one around issues of this here. Um, mm -hmm. We need to give time to other ways of dealing with our community violence. That's the only thing I'm going to say about that, right? Like, like people just started in national media started saying defund the police. A couple months ago, that shit wasn't thirty years. I mean, like in the mainstream, it was just a couple months ago. And most people have most um, municipalities haven't had enough time to do that. Like this sessions hasn't changed. Like you know, they haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. Um, and the reason I'm just saying that because I think like the pushback now because we have all these upticks in particular cities around the country around violence and all that. People are like, well, see, told you we need to go back to the police. We need to go back to the police. Or and I'm just saying that like people have literally just on a mainstream level talking about and in some places even implementing some things do we think that we're going to end generations of systemic racism and violence in just a couple of months because somebody a few people said we want to abolish it so we don't the police well we're about to we we defunded the police or we reallocated re police budget in this municipality you know a couple months ago and look violence went up mm. what the, fuck you think? You think the violence went up because of that <laughs> like at least like first of all like violence i always say is a it's a underlying, there's a lot of underlying traumas, right? That are true to that. I think that's why I put it in the book too. Like I wrote about those things, right? Not so much about the incident. Like I didn't tell you a whole bunch about like the actual act of the crime that I was a part of. I mm -hmm. gave you a detail of it, but I didn't spend the whole book writing about this shit that happened, right? This horrific thing that happened. I wrote about all the other things that I was like, oh shoot, all these things contrib could probably contribute to why I was there that day, right? Um, so anyway, I, I don't have a specific answer to that question. I know y'all do, man, but I, I think, you know, Cause reparations, we should get reparations. How that looks and all that shit, I don't know. You know what I mean? I, you know, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not the policy expert there. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not a policy expert either, but what I will say is two things about reparations. Number one, we're not gonna get to reparations if a vocal and large enough group of us try to begrudge people that come from the Caribbean or come from the continent. So mm -hmm. um, if, if we if we start to split hairs and, and I, you know, whatever, I'm not even gonna say the name of what I'm talking about. I think y'all know <laughs> what I'm talking about. But mm -hmm. sitting around, I'm, I'm an African-American woman. All of my family that I know of that I can trace are African-American. Begrudging Marlon, who is, whose parents are from Trinidad, reparations is absolutely ridiculous. That makes no sense whatsoever. So I'll say that. Number two, reparations is needs to be, um, I think there need to be serious financial instruments in place. It can't be a one-time payment, which I know most serious reparations discussions are not about one-time payments. Sometimes, though, I feel like, you know, in, in the midst of us joking around, like, where's my check? We're not thinking expansively enough about how much um, our labor has built and how much our labor continues to build and bolster this country. So the, our output needs to be matched with what we receive. And the consistency of our output needs to be matched with what we receive. As far as defunding, defunding the police, I'm gonna just let that sit there because I don't talk about police like that um, right now. I do think, no, let me say this. I think the overfunding of police in whatever form you wanna talk about is really dangerous. And mm -hmm. I think that it's really important, you know, again, what Marlon said, when we talk about defund the police, it needs to be clear, not to the media, because media will say, oh, defund them. And I'm in the media, so I know people say defund the police. That means you want to take money away from the police, and that's the end of it, and then crime's going to go up. It's not It's not that simple, but I think the discussion about defunding, we all need to know what we're talking about when we say defund. Because I think there's a group of people who truly mean defund and divest from all police, and then there are people who believe that we should reallocate money so that police aren't, you know, um, responding to mental health calls or whatever, we need to decide what we really mean before we can seriously push for any radical change in policing. Because if some of us are talking about incremental and some of us are talking about overall, then we're not straight. You know, we don't, we don't have our program together to even begin to have a, a, an actual discussion about how to do this. But I would suggest people read Miriam Kava because yeah. that's that's Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Those are people who you know will seriously engage you and and will be worthy of your question. I think about that sort of thing. And Marlon yeah. too, he's an abolitionist. He's 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 being humble. But I guess my my point is just you know there are experts in this field, and I think that they need to be uplifted. Yeah, yeah. I mean. I, I, so first of all, I highlight Mariam Cobb. You should get her book, and you know, and uh, 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 and as well as Dr. Wilson Gilmore. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the reason why, but the other thing about this, you said I'm abolitionist. You know, like I didn't. The book got the title "An Abolitionist Freedom Song," right? And you know, it's marketed as an abolitionist text, and it is in, it is in sense. But I didn't go into it like that. I didn't say to my editor, "Listen, I want to write a book about abolition." That wasn't the shit I wanted to write about. And we read mm -hmm. the book. I don't talk about abolition until like the last, I don't know, 10 pages, 15, 20 pages, something like that. It's the first time you haven't seen me ever bring that up, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like a little context to it. Um, I think, and so I'm saying there's a journey to that. And I'm also saying that like abolition is not an end. It's like you don't just, you're gonna abolition today and it, like, it's a thing and ends today. It's a journey of things, but it's also like getting to the root of the things, right? Always, it's always, that's really, it's always about getting to the root of the things. So when you think about policing um, or prisons, all these things that people are, lifting up in a in a much more uh, pronounced way because there's always been folks who have been doing this sort of work mm -hmm. folks are sort of like looking around looking around looking at history and looking at like modern history and like well damn these things just have not been helping us have they right and, and i think I, that's i think i just awareness i think it's the evolution of our species right when we're like wait 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 these things that we got that have been condi conditioned to believe will help will save us maybe they don't really do it. Maybe there's other things we need to be doing internally. Maybe it's other work. Maybe it's an issue with the resource. Maybe it's just, uh, and because the thing about abolition is not only idea. There are people who actually got policy policy platforms around what that looks like too, 
Also, and, and none of these policy platforms do they say, well, by November 1st, we would have completely defunded the such and such police department, right? Because it's just also not, it's also not bure bureaucratically possible to do anything like that. It, it just, you know what I mean? Politically possible to do that thing. I think what it is when you have pushback against it, it's people, it's just a pushback of the idea that there's something that we, this pushback and there's a little bit of fear of that, like we can try something different. Right, this things to expand on this things to try. Something that Mariam Kaba would always say is that we need to try everything. Right, when we think about other alternatives, she always says like we need to try everything. Right, and that's abolition is one of the things. It's a politic, but it's and it's a strategy, but it's not the only thing. Right, I want people to understand. I like I'm not religious about anything. I'm not religious about religion either. Right, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now you see that in the book too. I'm not religious about the idea of abolition either, but I don't believe we've given it enough time and enough energy. That's what I'm saying. And I'm also saying that like, I've seen, or what people are saying, but say particularly me, I've seen the depth of the worst of us, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 like I have a certain vantage point, right? Like I've, I've experienced the worst of us. I always say that the time I was inside, I shared space, conversations, broke bread, played ball, seen cry, people who have done everything you can think about. Everything, image, I, I can I can tell you a story about somebody, right? And I'm able to see them beyond that thing. And that's hard. I'm not saying everybody got to be able to do that, right? I was in prison with folks. So, you know what I mean? And so, but I am saying that like abolition is about getting to the root of why things are happening the way they are. You know what I mean? Getting to the root of like how we get better solutions, right? And part of getting to the root in terms of on an interpersonal basis is trying to ask a question like, why would somebody do that thing, mm -hmm. right? And maybe it's not all your work to do that. I'm saying there are people whose job is to do that. I'm saying that we should give them the chance to do that work. Mm -hmm. um, I ain't got no questions. Uh, yeah, the, the doors of the church are open. No, you say you ain't you ain't religious, but that was a great way to hit the conversation. It sure was. Mm -hmm. Sure was. It's about nothing. I well, it looks like nobody else has questions, right? Yeah. So I, think, I mean, it's been an hour already. I think that's yeah. how these that's things are. That flew by. Yeah. So, oh, uh, yeah. right on time. Look at that. There she goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess there's no more questions. Thank you all so much for this discussion. I was just sitting here, like, almost slack jawed <laughs> at uh, everything that was being said. I'm so grateful to uh, have hosted um, such amazing, amazing authors together. Um, Please, if you have not yet gotten your copies of the book, all all of the books by all the authors can be found at Uncle Bobby's. So you know you know what to do. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to Kissy Layman who left us early. Thank you, uh, Akiba Solomon, Regina Bradley, Marlon Peterson. This has been amazing. Um, I I really hope that uh, yeah I hope that all these words reach to the furthest corners um, where they're needed. Thank you. And thank, thank you to Uncle Bobby's. Shout to Uncle Bobby's. Shout to Uncle Bobby's. Philly, what's up? <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, Philly John Productions. <laughs> Everyone have a great night. And be All right. Take, take so good much. care, y'all. <laughs> Truce is over. <laughs>